we have just about reached 12 o'clock GMT, so we shall get started with the webinar. Firstly, a huge welcome to everyone who's joined us live for this webinar from around the world. This is our second webinar from the Society for the Environment. Um, so just to run through who I am to begin with. So my name is Phil Underwood. I am the marketing executive here at the Society for the Environment. I will be just introducing things to begin with. So I've got the easy job and then I'll be handing over to, uh, we've got two chartered environmentalists with us today, uh, Nigel and Laura, and they'll be giving an insight into uh, why I become a chartered environmentalist. So my details are on your screen at the moment. So if you have any questions after the webinar, then please feel free to contact me uh, and we'll try and answer those as best as possible. So to begin with, I'm just going to give a bit of an introduction who, to the, who the Society for the Environment is. So the Society for the Environment holds a Royal Charter, which was awarded in 2004. We are the custodian of two professional registrations, the Chartered Environmentalist, or CM Register, and the Registered Environmental Technician, or RMF Tech Register. As the name suggests, CM is a chartership level registration with the requirement of at least four uh, years relevant experience and master's level knowledge. Uh, RF Tech is our technician level registration with the requirement of at least two years of relevant experience and knowledge to level three, uh, which in the UK is the likes of um, A level, uh, level three, NVQ, and so on. So the society operates as an umbrella organization, currently with 25 professional bodies as constituent bodies, 24 of which are licensed to award the Chartered Environmentalist registration. The number of experts registered as Chartered Environmentalists currently stands at just over 7,300 worldwide. And the society also uh, recognizes the exceptional contributions of currently 71 individuals by awarding them with the Honorary Fellowship of the Society for the Environment. So before we move on, if you're interested to hear more about the Registered Environmental Technician Register, uh, if you take a look at our upcoming webinars, there's a, a couple of RF Tech webinars coming up. So uh, please feel free to register for those after this webinar. So as mentioned, there are currently 24 professional bodies who register their members with the correct experience and qualifications and so on as chartered environmentalists. These professional bodies come from a wide range of industries and sectors, and you can now see them on your screen in front of you. Uh, it wasn't the easiest of tasks to get all of them onto one slide, but I hope they are visible enough for you. Uh, if you are unable to see them, uh, then they are on our website as well, so please head there and have a look through uh, the relevant pages on our website. So the first requirement of becoming a Chartered Environmentalist is to become a member of one of our licensed bodies at their required membership level, which does vary across licensed bodies in terms of the terminology used for their membership levels, but it's just worth conversation with them to find out uh, what the requirement is uh, to then become a Chartered Environmentalist. So initially, please contact the membership departments at your chosen licensed body to get the ball rolling um, for the Chartered Environmentalist application. They'll then talk you through the next steps. And the next steps will focus on how you meet the required competencies, which can be found on our website, but the licensed body will also provide those details to you. Okay, so moving on to the, the main part of our webinar today. So it's enough from me. As mentioned, we have two chartered environmentalists. Uh, they are from both from Skanska. Uh, they have kindly volunteered to talk through their chartered environmentalist experiences with you today. So these are Laura and Nigel. Uh, Laura is a senior environmental advisor and Nigel is a Senior Environmental Compliance Manager. I hope I got that right. So through the power of rock, paper, scissors, uh, Nigel will be providing his Chartered Environmentalist insight first, and then we'll hand over to Laura. I'll pop back again at the end of the talks 
to ask any questions. So, Nigel, it's over to you. Thanks, Phil. Um, I'll just wait till I get full control. Um, given that both Laura and myself work for Skanska, um, I want to start with giving you a quick overview of who Skanska UK are before describing my current role and how I got here, how I became a chartered environmentalist, and then talking about some of the benefits of being a chartered environmentalist. So, Skanska UK were formed in 2000 and now employ about 6,000 staff with our 2016 revenue being just over £1.8 billion. We work across the buildings and infrastructure sectors as a developer, designer, contractor and operator. And our past contracts include the Gherkin building in London, the M25 widening scheme uh, and we also worked on Crossrail. We're now working on projects such as the A14 highways upgrade near Cambridge, a new hospital at Papworth. We work on several projects, uh, water projects for clients like Thames Water, Welsh Water and Angling Water. And we're also now working on HS2. Laura works for our facility management division uh, who do the FM in schools, hospitals and both public and commercial buildings. Our parent company is Skanska AB. They're based in Stockholm, Sweden, and were formed in 1887. They also operate as a contractor and developer across Scandinavia, the United States, Eastern Europe, United Kingdom, and employ just over 40,000 staff with annual revenues just over £16 billion. So my current role is that of Senior Environmental Compliance Manager for Skanska UK. That means that I maintain the environmental documents in our management system. I'm a member of our Environmental Compliance Leadership Group that leads on environmental management and compliance. I liaise with our external certification body on um, ISO 14001 audits. And we actually gained ISO 14001 2015 certificate in April 2016. We were one of the first parts of Skanska to achieve this and also one of the first UK construction companies. I also collect, analyse and report on our env environmental performance data. I undertake what we call as EMS peer reviews across the Skanska Global Business Units <clears throat> and I'm also uh, attend our environmental leadership team meetings. I work in the central environment team, which is part of our environment enabling function, which is shown on the right hand side of this page. There are 80 full time environmental and community liaison staff in this function, and they sit in the central team, but mostly within the buildings and infrastructure sectors based on projects. The environment team undertake environmental management and compliance on our projects and also seek out green innovations, which we can fund with our green fund. We also work on promoting what we call commercialising green, which is putting together case studies showing the financial benefits of good environmental management. So looking at my journey as to how I got to my current role, uh, it can be split into two very distinct parts. Firstly, my, my career as a civil engineer. In 1984, I graduated with a degree in civil engineering and started out as a civil engineer on a graduate training scheme, working with a company based in Warrington. I spent time in the materials testing laboratory, out on site as an engineer's assistant, and then went back into the office working in both the design and tendering departments. I then went back out on site as an assistant site manager and then site manager on civil engineering projects across the Northwest, and these were mainly highway schemes. In 1995, I gained my chartered engineer and member of the institution of civil engineer status and then went back out on site as a project manager, again on civil engineering sites across the northwest of England. In 2000, Skanska UK were formed, uh, and my career took a completely new and greener path. 
Skanska AB uh, basically told Skanska UK that they had to get an ISO 14001 certificate within two years. And this was when I first became involved in environmental management in that I was put on the group uh, that wrote Skanska's first environmental management system. At that time, I was still as a site manager, uh, but I had the additional responsibilities uh, of having an environmental advisor role. Over time, that role developed into a full-time environment manager for one part of the business. But at, at that time, there was only about five full-time environmental professionals within Skanska UK. In 2005, um, I started on a distance learning course and eventually attained a postgraduate diploma in sustainability and environmental management. And just after that, I attained chartered environmentalist status. Following this, my environmental role gradually expanded uh, to eventually become a senior sustainability manager in the central environment team, looking at things like uh, our, our strategy and again, how we operate as a uh, company. And then finally, I came to the role of senior environmental compliance manager that I now have. In 2015, I also attained uh, full membership of IEMA. So why did I apply to become a chartered environmentalist? Being a chartered engineer, I, I was looking for an equivalent qualification within the environment sector. The chartered environmentalist competencies recognise that not just significant expertise, experience, knowledge and skills in environmental management, but they also look at effective communication and interpersonal skills. I was looking for professional membership that was independent of discipline. You have to remember that at the time I, I was a civil engineer. I wasn't a fully qualified environmental professional. Uh, Chartered environmentalist is a peer reviewed qualification. Uh, so it's reviewed independently, which gives it more gravitas. Um, and I was also keen to have a qualification that had a similar code of professional conduct to that that I have to comply with at the Institution of Civil Engineers. And I think the Code of Professional Conduct is really important in that it says that you have, you have to serve as an example to others and not engage in any sort of dishonest or fraudulent conduct. So how did I apply to become a Chartered Environmentalist? As I said, it was via the Institution of Civil Engineers, who were one of the nine licensed bodies at the time. So I completed and submitted an application form to the, to the ICA that shows that I met the required competencies. And then I also confirmed that I'd abide by the uh, Code of Professional Conduct. So what are the benefits um, of being a Chartered Environmentalist? From a personal view, it sets you apart from others working in the field of environmental management. Uh, there are approximately 6,300 chartered environmentalists in the UK, uh, with another thousand globally. It recognises wider competencies from di different disciplines. Uh, you also join a wider network, both are the Society for Environment and also the licensed bodies. You get access to regular events and CPD resources. As a chartered environmentalist, you can contribute to the Society for the Environment and influence people in making environmental decisions. You also promote the profession uh, and it gives you opportunities and roles that you might otherwise not have gained. As a result of my knowledge, experience and qualifications, I was given the task of putting together Skanska UK's application for the Sunday Times Best Green Companies Award, which we actually won in 2011. Looking at the employer, benefits. It gives the employers confidence in your abilities. It also shows that you abide by a code of professional conduct. And we're finding that clients are now looking for chartered environmentalists to cover certain positions on our projects. It also gives Skanska assurance in that people reviewing and signing off environmental documents have the right qualifications. Skanska UK are also 
members of the IEMA Employer Forum. And via that, we've, we've set up uh, workshops for our environment team to gain professional qualifications all the way up to a full member of IEMA and Chartered Environmentalists. So we actually mentor and buddy up uh, people within, within Skanska to gain these qualifications. At present, we've now got about 20 Chartered Environmentalists in the environment enabling function with 10 pending. And another benefit is that uh, you can come into the Chartered Environmentalist qualification by different disciplines, via the licensed bodies. In Skanska, we've, we've now got people from the building profession, the Chartered Surveyors profession, who want to become Chartered Environmentalists. So looking at some of the benefits that I've done in the case studies, My experience and knowledge is used in different parts of Skanska um, when needed at both the leadership level, either in the environmental leadership team or environmental compliance leadership group, where my environmental competence and chartered environmentalist qualifications contribute to this. Skanska globally uses something called the Skanska colour palette to illustrate our approach to environmental management. Uh, and this is split into four priority areas, energy, carbon, materials, and water. We want to move our projects across from the vanilla or compliance side of the palette across to the right-hand side, which we call deep green or near zero environmental impact. And we map our projects on this color palette using stepping stones in the green section with specific criteria needed for each stepping stone. Given my experience and knowledge and qualifications, I actually review uh, Skanska UK project applications to become a deep green project. And where Laura and myself are both sat, uh, this is Skanska's first deep green project, but Bentley Works near Doncaster. And I acted as the independent checker for their deep green application. Okay, if you're interested, the case study on the right hand side is on our external website. So my future, I'm not quite at the twilight or end of my career. Um, I still want to continue in the role of environment and sustainability. I want to continue to promote careers in the environment and sustainability profession and also promote the work of the Society for Environment uh, and its licensed bodies. And again, continue to support people in their career development. So to summarise why I became a Chartered Environmentalist, it sets you apart. You obtain the qualification by independent peer review and recognition of your competence. You become part of a wider network and it also promotes the environment and sustainability profession. That concludes my presentation. So I'll now hand back to Phil to hand over to Laura. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that, Nigel. That was, that was really quite interesting. That was brilliant. Um, so we're going to hand straight over to Laura now, as Nigel says. So uh, Laura, as I mentioned earlier, is a senior environmental advisor at Skanska. So Laura, over to you. Thank you very much, Phil. Thank you very much, Nigel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for listening. I'm going to follow from what Nigel's just said and give yourselves and share a different perspective to complement his as someone that has become chartered in the last three years. So as it says then in the joining instructions and as uh, introduced by Phil kindly, I'm a senior environmental advisor in Skanska. I work in facilities management and I've been here for almost three years. In my current role here at Skanska, I have a number of responsibilities, chiefly my day-to-day -day involves advising contracts in facilities on their day-to-day -day operations and on their environmental compliance requirements. Now, due to the fact that our contracts and our projects are very varied, those requirements vary too. One day I might be advising on European emissions trading schemes, a different day on discharge consents, waste duty of care or ecological considerations. So that's quite a broad bag when it comes to compliance and risk mitigation. I assist projects in measuring, monitoring, and continuously improving their sustainability performance. Um, we measure that through, my Nigel was just presenting, the colour palette and the position, also through a number of dashboards 
and also through the aspects and impacts registers, but more on those later. Like Nigel, a lot of my role also involves data collation, analysis and reporting of environmental performance data, both internally and externally, including to, and increasingly so, to a number of clients and stakeholders for different purposes. And part of my role is also the identification and the introduction of commercial opportunities at the end of the day, we are a business, and looking at how greening our business can help our clients and ourselves financially, environmentally and socially is part of the role. Recently, I've been involved in some solar PV feasibility studies, looking at healthy buildings and the opportunities to introduce the well standard and water performance contracting, just to name a few. As part of the growing team, I also have line management responsibilities. I have one person directly reporting to me in two dotted lines and we're increasing team. And all of that happens, as, as Nigel introduced, in facility services, which is the part of Skanska UK that looks after buildings and assets maintenance. And again, that's very broad. We cover, essentially what we do is keep buildings and grounds running for a number of contracts, all the way across Midlands and Scotland, and also in London and down to the Southwest. We have 65 clients working in over a thousand locations, and our key sectors include healthcare, education, local government, blue light, including emergency services like the police, commercial property, and also defense, which includes the MOD. We're a team within facilities of over 800 people, and the environmental advisory within that team is over 12 people. Our smallest contract is a small rural primary school, and the largest contract is the largest hospital in Europe, St. Bart's in London. Within Skanska, in addition to my role as an environmental advisor, I undertake a number of additional functions. I promote our community involvement and volunteering agenda as our facility services community rep. I've also become a STEM ambassador through which I encourage stakeholders and young people to promote and pursue careers in STEM like I have and the benefits that that brings. I support others with external and internal auditing as an EMS lead auditor, a qualification that I've gained within the role. I deliver training to colleagues and also to external clients on a range of environmental topics and disciplines. More recently, through our increasing focus as a company on health and safety and well-being, I've become a mental health ambassador. To summarise, my current role as a senior environmental advisor, no two days are the same. And to get here, similar to Nigel, I'll just share quickly a little bit about my journey to what I do now, but also within that, how I became a chartered environmentalist. As you can see on the screen, I started in 2005 after I graduated from UEA in environmental sciences. Environmental management was something that I knew I wanted to work in and I was lucky enough to be able to pursue a career in. I started first of all as an environmental analyst and straight away in a small company, but straight away I realized that a way of bridging the gap between the theoretical knowledge that I had as a graduate and the practical hands-on knowledge I was going to need was to become more involved with one of the licensed bodies. So I became an associate member of IEMA. Several years passed and I had a number of roles within public sector and private sector organisations. I was involved in ISO 14001 and EMAS as a coordinator in the local council. I was a project technical officer in an energy charity where I supported different clients on different sustainability requirements and projects, including carbon management. Within that same organization, I then gained a little more responsibility and became a sustainability projects coordinator. And then I moved on to working at a local university. Between the gaps of sustainability projects coordinator and project officer, I realized that it would be beneficial to complement my knowledge of environmental legislation, as this was an area that increasingly I was having to read up on in order to be able to perform my duties. So I decided to enroll in a part-time distance learning master's in environmental law, which initially was going to take 14 months. And I completed after five years because doing so along a full-time job presented its own set of challenges. And towards the end of 2015, after just after completing that master's in environmental law, I, uh, my job became um, at risk. And I was basically looking for the next career move to give me security. During this period, it gave, I had the opportunity of assessing where I wanted to go. And I decided, having consulted with AIMA, a few colleagues, and also the Scientific Environment, having looked at one of the webinars, that uh, Chartered Environmentalists and increasing my licensed body membership to full 
membership might be something to give you competitive advantage, which is what I did. And at that point, I was lucky enough to also come across Skanska in the position of environmental advisor, to which I applied and I was successful. Um, during the first few months within Skanska, I finalised my application to chartership and became chartered towards the end of uh, 2015. So this is where I am today, three years in, and uh, three, just over three years as a chartered and full-time full member by email. So the four main reasons why I finally applied to become chartered, and I say finally because it was something that I was aware of for a number of years and I had toyed with, but knowing that the postgraduate qualification or equivalent work experience would be something that would help me in my application, I decided to postpone a little bit. First and foremost, the main reason I applied when I did to become chartered was to gain competitive advantage when applying for those jobs and all future promotions, because I figured having looked at the market, not all applicants perhaps would be chartered. So I was hoping that it would give me that additional point. I also thought it would be important to be recognised by fellow environmentalists as a peer and to ensure their better understanding of my areas of expertise and experience since no two chartered environmentalists are the same. I wanted to give stakeholders and clients additional assurance of the level of quality, the purpose and the impact of the work we conduct, but also to raise their awareness and dispel myths of the needed competencies to do so. And lastly, I wanted to commit to and promote the environmental profession more widely. And I thought that by becoming chartered, I would be able to do so. How did I go about applying for chartership itself? From, first of all, in terms of the logistics of doing so, once I decided that it was the right time and I started investigating what the process would entail, I would say it took around nine months for me to become fully chartered. First and foremost, I sought advice, as I said, from the Society of the Environment, from IEMA, because I was already an associate member, and also from colleagues. Although I must say, at the time, there weren't many people that I knew that were chartered, not until I joined Skanska. I took part in a number of webinars so that I could become better informed about the different options and ways of applying. And at that point, I was informed that there was the opportunity of having assigned a mentor. And I thought, why not? So I asked kindly and was assigned a mentor, and I found that incredibly valuable, and their input very much helped me throughout the process. I dipped in and out for about five months of the application and the preparation. The reason I say that is this is the time I was also handing in my master's dissertation. Anyone that's done a postgraduate course and has been in that position can understand lots of different competing deadlines. But I did dip in and out of the preparation and the personal statement writer. I practiced the interview and discussed certain issues with my mentor. And once I was confident that uh, the application was ready to be submitted, I did so towards the end of the summer of 2015. That process was, I found, very straightforward. And I were very clear with their communications in terms of how to do so. And once the application was accepted and I got to stage two, I was offered a panel or a face-to-face -face interview, to which I chose a panel over the phone, because the panel interview gave me a flexible and a beneficial approach, given that I was working full-time. So at that point, an interview was set up, and <coughs> that included a test a few weeks prior in terms of the technology to ensure that I would be comfortable. I did a couple of dry runs of some of the potential questions or like these with my mentor, and on the day itself, it took around two hours from beginning to end. The panel that interviewed me explained and introduced themselves at the beginning so that I could see them and I could hear what their roles and expertises were. And they clarified how the session would go. To be honest, the interview felt more like an open discussion. I was very comfortable throughout and they made it very easy. It was a compliment to the application and a chance for me to express a little bit more about my expertise, about my experience to date, and for them to ask me pertinent questions. And at the end of that, I basically waited, and actually only a couple of weeks later, IEMA confirmed that um, I've become chartered. The celebration ensued. So overall, in my experience, this was, if I had to summarize it, easier than I expected at first. And a number of benefits from having become chartered have resulted. For me, there are plenty of these benefits. The ones that I have 
envisaged and that I have realized. First of all, becoming chartered gives you an advantage over the competition. As I said at the beginning, that was one of my main reasons for deciding to become chartered at the time or apply for it. But having seen now and increasingly been involved in recruiting in our own organization, it is something that increasingly employers are looking for. It helps to clarify perceptions and provide assurance to others about the different levels of expertise and competencies needed. And on that note, demonstrating being chartered helps to demonstrate those competencies, the skills, the expertise and the commitment of our profession and to our profession. It's an opportunity to become exposed to different journeys within that profession, like Nigel said. Having become chartered, I feel, and I'll give a few examples, has given me that opportunity to share with others and look a little bit further afield within the organisation at different areas of work, different responsibilities, different decisions. And I now feel like I hold a greater responsibility and can influence decision making at a separate level than when I joined. It helps to raise the bar while recognising different routes to get here. And I think that's been already mentioned by, by Nigel. Essentially, there are no, chartered, no two chartered environmentalists are the same. But I would argue that makes it richer. We all bring different aspects from our different walks of the profession and our different disciplines. But what makes us consistent is that we all have those competencies and that commitment. It supports the development and promotion of the profession to others. And it gives you the opportunity to give back either by mentoring others or by describing the process and sharing that with them to make them inspired to take, to take the plunge themselves. At the end of the day, also thinking about what we're here to do as a profession, I feel that being chartered helps me to enhance environmental protection because now I'm doing better work in better ways. I'll share some of those examples with you all. Since becoming chartered, here at Scanster, some of my competencies have been used in a number of ways. My environmental legal knowledge has meant that I have signed off a number of documents and continue to do so from risk and opportunities registers to, which you can see on the top left, to the company's legal register, which I review on behalf of facilities on an annual basis. That's all part of that and many other resources are part of our environmental management system. I'm having a look at that. It's given me a multidisciplinary experience because now I get to work with different contracts and to help set the strategic vision for certain parts of the organization, like our contracts on an annual basis. And the effective communication and personal skills, which is, like Nigel mentioned earlier, one of the things that we want to see in chartered environments is, it means that having worked on those and honing those skills, I now get to represent the organisation at external forum, like conferences, workshops, talks, events, and also more recently, awards, including the writing and applying for those awards. And last year, Facility Services in Scans won the Sustainable FM index, which means that we were externally recognised to be the most sustainable facilities management company in the UK out of 24 competitors, which obviously also gives me a little bit of personal satisfaction to have been able to be involved with others in that process. I get to present and gather evidence when conducting incident investigations for internal and for external auditing, and the integrity piece that our code of conduct makes us abide to also I, I I personally see is paramount when it comes to those tasks and those activities. And just to give you a bit of a flavour, because it's not just all documentation, the sustainable management of the environment, one of our key competencies, can be demonstrated by a number of very different feasibility studies and opportunities, like I mentioned earlier. One of the roles within the environmental advisor is to bring innovation in the, the to solutions and also look at the best practical environmental options across our contracts. What you can see on the bottom left is that recently two of our diesel vans in our maintenance operations in one of our hospitals have been switched to electric vans, fully electric, with obvious environmental, financial, but also social benefits since these are quieter. And obviously in a healthcare setting, we want to ensure that the patients are in a calmer environment. So the practical demonstrations of those competencies are also numerous. Last couple of slides. Some of the things that I've got planned for the future in terms of my role as an environmental advisor and also as a chartered environmentalist, I'd like to seek and I seek greater collaboration with the society, but also with AIMA and the STEM network. Some examples are webinars like today, which I'm very happy to have taken part of, World Environment Day coming up, and stakeholder engagement. Some of our stakeholders, again, are 
involved in these activities. So it's linking with them through, for example, career days or site open days where we can get different stakeholders in the community, like schools or universities, to come and see our projects and our contracts. I'd like to at one point offer mentorship like I was benefiting from when I was in the process of applying to others. And there are people within our team that, with whom I've already shared my positive experience of chartership. I'd like to develop my non-environmental competencies further because again, I think they can be a useful way of complementing the environmental um, range of competencies. In my personal case for the next six months, I'm working on my leadership and my commercial acumen. And uh, longer, for the next eight, 12 months, I'd like to be promoted to environmental manager. And that's something that I'm working on. So I'm sticking around with Inskafka. That slide. In conclusion, I believe to have personally greatly benefited and continue to benefit from chartership, and I would definitely recommend it to others. I would say that taking the preparation to apply for chartership gives one an opportunity to take stock of what you've accomplished to date. Sometimes having a LinkedIn profile or a CV doesn't really raise from the paper some of those opportunities that have been taken or what sets you aside. But spending some time reflecting though on those gives one an opportunity to also plan the future. What would you like to progress to? Where would you like to be as an environmentalist? And what would you like to influence or achieve? So I would say it's useful in that sense. The process is more straightforward and less time consuming than I first suspected. And between the licensing bodies, the society's assistant and the help of my mentor, I would say it can have actually been easier. If anything, I wish I started the process sooner. Being chartered helps to manage and maintain expectations of our profession and to raise awareness of what it takes to be a professional environmentalist amongst others, especially those that might not know too much about things. We get to be involved in more strategic decision making within our organisations and in doing so, taking on more responsibilities and having a higher capacity to influence environmental outcomes and the satisfaction that comes in doing so. Lastly, and like Nigel said, I share that we can be part of a professional network in being chartered with very varied and exciting opportunities. So in my mind, chartered environmentalists is not a no brainer That's it from me. I'll hand over back to you, Phil. Perfect. Thank you very, very much to both Nigel and Laura for those for those talks that was really really interesting i hope everyone else found that very useful we're going to go straight into questions we have had a few questions through the registration process so when you registered uh, we asked you if you wanted to ask any questions to our speakers there and then so those questions we'll run through those now so the first question what did you find the most challenging in the process of becoming CM. So Laura, if I hand that one over to you. Okay, sure. As I said, it actually was less of a challenging process than I first expected, but I would argue the, the only issue I had was that I wrote nine versions of the personal statement when I was applying. It was a quite time consuming process and I think the reason for this was that I approached it as an extended CV. So a long list of what I had achieved and what I had done and where I went before. Then discussing this with my mentor and actually looking into the guidance, I would recommend that others overcome that challenge by instead starting by focusing, at the, focusing on the environmental competencies. So I found it much easier as I was drafting it later on, to instead look at the environmental competencies of a chart environmentalist, seeing where I could provide valid examples from my own experience and structuring it in that way. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Now, Nigel, your CM application was a, a number of years ago, but have you got anything to add to that at all? Any, any further challenges that you, you saw during the CM application process? I think the, the, the main challenge for me was, given I did this back in 2005, um, I, I didn't know any chartered environmentalists at the time, and I didn't get much support at all with the application. Um, but g given the fact that I'd, also, I'd done a full application to become a chartered engineer 
and them ICE member probably 10 years earlier that I was yeah. fairly used to the application process so I don't want to say it wasn't difficult it was it was difficult because I didn't have anybody to speak to about it um, yes. yeah hopefully but, a few uh, more chartered environmentalists yeah, around yeah, now, so. yeah absolutely uh, so, so that, that that was the main challenge not be, not being able to speak to or not knowing any other chartered environmentalists to speak to about the application process okay but that's, that's, that's um, obviously changed now so yeah and now we can draw on the experience of people like yourself to uh, to help out those who are applying at the moment so that's that's good sure yeah yeah okay so next question we had via the registration process was would this qualification be recognized in the United States? Now, uh, British chartered standards are recognized across the world. Um, but as always, it very much depends on the organization or the ind individual that you're talking to. So essentially, yes. But Laura or Nigel, do you have any uh, insight into uh, working abroad or, or chartered environmentalists that you know of abroad uh, any insight into into that at all i i am an external auditor for um well, I'm a sql verifier which is a infrastructure sustainability rating tool um so i go to non-skanska projects um and that includes Sc scandinavia that sweden is the only place where i've come across a chartered environmentalist um I, th I don't know about the United States. I don't, I don't know anybody who's charted environmentalists over there, but, but Sweden, I've, I've come across a couple over there. Um, and, and they work for well-known <laughs> multinational design consultancies. Right, okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, we do have chartered environmentalists uh, around the world, essentially. Um, the majority are in the UK at the moment. However, the, the next uh, l largest population of chartered environmentalists is within the Southeast Asia kind of area. Um, so it is recognized uh, globally, it, but again, it just depends who, who you're talking to at the time. Um, so the next question we had, and the last question from the registration was, how is the process for a chartered engineer to become a chartered environmentalist for someone from an aerospace industry? In terms of the aerospace industry, we don't have a licensed body currently who would be directly focused on the aerospace industry. Uh, however, it very much depends on your discipline as to which licensed body you would go for. So that would be, it could be IMECE, the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, um, ICE, the Institute of Civil Engineers, um, possibly IEMA, possibly the Society of Operations Engineers. So there's a couple of options there depending on what your discipline is now nigel you are a chartered engineer and a chartered environmentalist um i wonder if you could just give a bit of a, a comment on the relationship between the two charterships um how they how they link because there are a number of chartered engineers who are also chartered environmentalists from a civil engineer perspective um the, the ICE Institution of Civil Engineers is, is now promoting um, a lot more than they used to, the, the link between what engineers do and their contribution to sustainable development, for want of a better word. Um, obviously, engineers d design stuff like roads and bridges so that they have to be aware of um, wider issues such as you know climate change resilience. Um, so there's definitely a more of a push from the ICE perspective. The, the application process for me was completely different. I, I came from a civil engineer background onto a graduate training scheme, um, and it was quite a formalised process with the mm. ICE. So I, I was, I had what was called a supervising civil engineer in the company I was working for. It's a very structured. You do this, this, and this, which I didn't have as when I became a chartered environmentalist because just did it up really off my own back. Um, yeah. And I, th I think from what Laura said, now that the process to become chartered environmentalist is a bit more like what it was when I became a chartered engineer back in mm. 1990, whatever it was. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in simple terms, and to, to answer the question in very simple terms, if you are a chartered engineer and you want to become a chartered environmentalist, then that is totally possible. Um, 
you would need to be a member of one of our licensed bodies. Um, so have a look into which one of those suits you best. And then the, the process starts rolling from there, really. So we have some questions through from the, we had during the webinar itself. So the first question we've got here, again, I won't name names. I would like to ask both Laura and Nigel, what's their biggest setback in obtaining the Chartered Environmentalist registration was? Uh, and Laura, you touched on the fact that you you, d you delayed your application for a, a, a number of years because you were waiting potentially for the experience and so on. But I wonder what, uh, if any, setbacks you both had. Um, to add to that, one, one thing I don't think I mentioned or maybe did justice in my presentation, Help with the answer. None of the organisations I worked with or in when applying seemed to either know about what chartered environmentalist was or seemed to push for it at the time when I was applying for those roles. So the incentive from my employers at, it, until, I'm, until I joined Skanska, there didn't seem to be that much support or that much incentive or even awareness in some of the places I've worked. Some of them, they were very small organisations, but even one of the large universities I worked at. There didn't seem to be that much. It was very much uh, you can pursue this on the side if you wish. So that definitely was a bit of a setback, I would argue, because obviously it takes time, it takes uh, effort, and it takes a little bit of money to actually invest in in this. And it's definitely something that, as I said in my slides, it's paid off. But it, it was something that I had to get, I'd say, from of my impact to actually to actually get get started and do it. That's very different to, I would say, and it, it, it might just be my journey to chartership, but very different to when I joined Skanska, where it was made incredibly easy for me. And actually, I had the support of the organization. I had different ways of helping me towards finalizing the application and also towards the professional membership fees. So I would definitely say it's something that uh, that there could be a challenge uh, from from that perspective and i could see others uh, if, if their employers or if where they are at the time working if they don't see the benefit it might be a little bit of a battle i think it's what, that's why it's quite important to also demonstrate the benefits to organizations because it's both the personal benefit that you get with the chartership but like nigel said in his presentation the employer also gets quite a bit out of it okay yeah we're going to move we, we, i'm conscious of time so we're going to move on to the next question if that's okay so the next question is, we start off with many thanks to the presenters and the society for, for providing this insight. So no problem at all. Uh, I have some questions around the support uh, you gained from Skanska. Um, now, did were they able to provide you with things like time to be able to time to uh, from work to be able to uh, concentrate on the application? Um, time to do the assignments, that kind of thing. And Laura mentioned the mentor. Was that from Skanska or was it from AIMA? Uh, Laura. Okay, sure. So actually, so f first of all, mentor. Actually, I had already been allocated a mentor before I started at Skanska. So I was already in my previous role. The mentorship went, uh, the mentorship was secured through AIMA. So Aima offered me the opportunity to have a mentor and uh, I took that opportunity up and they searched for someone and actually it was someone quite senior in the local environment agency office. So they were also a chartered environmentalist also through licensed body Aima, but it wasn't, it, it, they, are, they, they don't have to be necessarily someone in your organization and they don't have to be necessarily someone in your sector. The, what they normally, the, the normal criteria from what I saw is that a mentor is someone that has chartered environmentalist status and has some experience in being able to coach or help someone else in going through the process. So as I say, mine was external. What Skanska provided me with, so as I say, before joining Skanska, I already was halfway through the process of applying. But what Skanska really provided me with was the incentive to, to finish. So basically, I could have dipped in and out for quite a few more months. But Skanska saw the value of me pursuing both uh, expanding my professional membership through IEMA to full membership. And they kindly offer each of us who are associated to a professional body, they, they kindly cover the membership fees for one of those bodies. So there was that incentive. There was also a Skanska qualification award. So Skanska, upon me becoming chartered, was kind of to give me a, a, a small award for as demonstration of their commitment of growing their chartered and their 
members within their own uh, rankings because we, we do have a focus on skills and competencies within the team. Um, lastly, yes, they, they did give me a bit of time to prepare for the interview and a bit of time aside for any um, additional requirements in the preparation process. At the time, the commitment and the yeah, reward, I'd say, were the three, the three benefits. What, what, one thing Laura didn't mention, we're Skanski UK are corporate members of IEMA, so as part of that membership, we, uh, we get um, free membership workshops that, that we run internally for, for Skanska staff, so that there's a practitioner membership level of IEMA workshop, and then there's a full member of IEMA workshop, so, so we encourage people to attend those that they're given in effect free it's in Skanska time um, and then as, as people start their application process having been on that workshop we, we'll link them up with an existing Skanska person who's a chartered environmentalist to, to help them through the application process I've, I've reviewed practitioner applications and <laughs> chartered environmentalist applications in the last three years or so so that, that's okay. additional additional support that we give as well Excellent. That was a really useful response and I hope that was helpful to the person that asked there. Um, we have another question that kind of links onto that. It's surrounding um, mentors. Were you able to practice the interview stage with your mentor and was that useful? Uh, I think that's following, uh, Laura mentioned it during her talk. Up to a point, yes. Uh, it was very useful. I say up to a point. Obviously, you don't get the questions from the panel in advance. It is an independent interview. But because men, the men, my mentor had experience of uh, himself having gone through the panel interview for Chartered Environmentalist status and from having uh, mentored a couple of other people, we c he could at least give me an, an idea of what to expect. Uh, so we bounced a few, we basically bounced a few questions back and forth based on my personal statement and my application and his own experience where he shared insights into the type of questions or the type of phrasing. We also focused on a few of the competency areas where I wanted to ensure that my answers were stronger when presenting evidence. So yes, it was useful. Yes, it was an opportunity. And even if someone didn't have a mentor, I would encourage that they discuss with another child environment and is what that process feels like, if nothing else, to put themselves at ease. That sounds like sound advice. Thank you very much for that. The next question, again, links on from that, really. Uh, was there anything about the CM process that you wished you knew before starting? And I guess, Laura, you must have, with your mentor, um, they would have given you a good insight into what the CM process would have been like or will be like when you go through the steps. So is there anything that you wished you knew, anything else that you wished you knew before starting? Mm, as you say, I think uh, I got quite a bit of it. I was lucky because... Now there's a lot more evidence and a lot more available information through the licensing bodies in society and through people that have done it to build that picture. The one thing that I wish I'd known was maybe um, when I first started thinking about it, as I say, I thought it was more convoluted and there'd be quite a bit of a gap, but actually it seemed to be quite a quick process from applying to getting the interview date. And in fact, I asked for my interview Day, I kindly asked for it to be postponed by two weeks because I didn't realise it was going to be so soon. So, <laughs> um, but no, I mean, all of that is quite clear in the guidelines and there's really good, strong communication once you actually get the process started. So, yeah, I wish I'd known was the fact that it was quite effective process. And um, hence, I would, I, would say, I would say to people, start the process of preparing early, but do... Once you start, once you submit your application, be ready to uh, to conduct that interview because it might turn around quite quickly. Well, that was a very positive response. That's good. Um, the next question is a little bit different. So it is: I have thirty years' experience in the water industry in technical and managerial roles. Uh, currently in a technical support role within wastewater operations within a water company. What would I need to do to gain membership or registration as it would be? Now, that's going to be tricky to answer as a whole. Um, first of all, you, you would need to be a member of one of our licensed bodies, as, as mentioned during the webinar. Um, in terms of waste and water, there's a number of licensed bodies that could work for that. Um, so just have a look into who our licensed bodies are. 
and then from there uh, have a have a chat with their membership department um, and then you basically need to be see how you meet the, the competencies there are 12 key competencies um, to become a chartered environmentalist uh, we haven't gone through those in today's webinar however they are available on our website uh, and if you make contact with uh, one of our licensed bodies they'll be able to provide the information about what those competencies are uh, and how you are able to meet them within your role and within your experience so that's the best thing to do with that um, and then uh, you'd be so, able to sorry Karen so, so, Phil yeah I, I, I could just add into that mm. we, we do have members of, our, of the Skanska environment team who are from a water sector background okay. um, and, and they're uh, that they, they've gone that they're SIWEM Chartered Institute of Water and Environmental yeah. Management that's right yeah so, so that, that's that's the route they've taken that they are Cy, members of SIWEM and they're now Chartered Environmentalists so it can be done <laughs> yes certainly can be done certainly can be done yeah there's a, there's a number of licensed bodies that could work SIWEM is certainly one of those so just have a look into those and uh, uh, there is detail about how to become a chartered environmentalist on our website and there is also the webinar that we did last month which was our very first webinar if you go onto the webinar pages on our website there is a recording of that particular webinar on there for you to have a look at um, we are we have pretty much reached our time for this webinar um, so apologies if we haven't reached your question um, if you wanted to ask the question still please send it to us via email um, my email details were at the very beginning of the webinar um, but I'll also be sending an email to you to ask you for feedback and um, so again if you wanted to reply to that email with a question feel very free to uh, the emails will only be going to the, through to those who have opted in to receive emails from the registration process so you're given that option if you didn't and you still want to ask a question please just email me uh, and we'll be able to answer that as best we can so that brings us to the end of the questions i mentioned just a moment ago about the how to become a chartered environmentalist webinar um, so please if you wanted to find out more about how to become a chartered environmentalist it says it in the title please go to the our website uh, and find the webinars page or go to our YouTube channel but the webinar page on our website is uh, detailed on the screen in front of you and lastly uh, we have World Environment Day which Laura briefly mentioned during her talk World Environment Day is a, a, a global UN initiative but the Society of the Environment champion World Environment Day alongside its licensed bodies uh, in fact IEMA are doing um, the they're looking into how they can champion World Environment Day as well. And then we have an event on the 5th of June that will be available for aspiring and current chartered environmentalists and registered environmental technicians and so on. So if you wanted to meet some chartered environmentalists, have a chat with them about how to become a chartered environmentalist or what their experience has been, then please feel free to come along to that. The registration is not open just yet, but it will be in the next day or two, possibly even today. So at the very lastly, thank you very, very much to Nigel and Laura for your time today. Um, I hope everyone listening found that really, really useful. It certainly had some interesting insights in there, um, which will be really useful for those who are thinking of becoming a chartered environmentalist. If you are still thinking of becoming a chartered environmentalist, then we wish you the best of luck. Um, but that's about it from our webinar today. So. We'll see you next time.